Hello, this video is entitled Velocity and Acceleration, specifically as it relates to vector valued functions. So let's take a look at our definitions here that we've seen before with R being defined as a vector valued function, where this can be, um, this is plain, of course, with I and J, but this also works, as you can see down here, for space. So the same thing, whether it's IJ, IJK. So I'll just jump down to the space one since it has the extra term in it. And you obviously, then if you don't need that extra term, don't worry about it. All right, so uh, motion moving along a, a space curve. And you have your vector value function right here in standard unit vector form. Of course, we can use component form. The velocity vector, these are going to be vectors. The velocity vector will be the derivative of the position vector. You know, similar to when we weren't, you know, using vectors back in Cal 1, we were just using, you know, a function of a single variable um, and not vectors. Well, these are, these are a single variable also, but they are vectors. And the acceleration then will be R double prime which will be the derivative of the velocity, so that will look familiar. Now let's take a look at speed. Speed is a not a vector, it's a scalar quantity, meaning it has um, no direction orientation to it. So the speed is actually calculated as the magnitude of the velocity vector. So that's just the magnitude right here, the square root of x prime squared plus y prime squared plus z prime squared. And the velocity vector is also known as a tangent vector. Because on a graph, uh, if you graph the velocity vector at a point value for t, it will graph a vector that is uh, tangent at that point. Now let's take a look. I don't suspect you're going to have to worry about graphing a lot of these. Certainly not in space, but probably not even the plane. But I did one in, in two dimensions that made it easier to graph manually. Let's take a look at this. So I'm taking the uh, vector value function t squared i plus t cubed j. And we're at the point one one. So this is going to come up, you know, from time to time. Uh, I'm trying to remember if it's come up before or anywhere else, but it, I think it has in the previous chapter. But anyway, just in case, let me mention it again. Is that if you are given, oh yes, I remember where it came up. And like if you had parametric equations of a line, they gave you a point, and you had to figure out what t would produce that point. Same kind of idea here. Well, with t squared and t cubed, to produce 1, 1, t would have to be 1. So these aren't going to be complicated by any means, but sometimes, you know, they, they could do the problem by giving you the t, or they can give you the point, and you have to find the t, like I said, which isn't that bad. Now to plot this, I know that we want to cover t equals 1, so I just use 0, 1, and 2. Figured that'd take care of it. With all the excitement, like I said, is at 1. So I'm putting the x represents t squared, y equals t cubed. So we have 0, 0 when t is 0, 1, 1 when it's 1, and 4, 8 when it's 2. So I graphed it. There's the dot for 1, 1. Here's the dot for 4, 8. And of course it would keep going and going and going. Now to figure out the velocity and the acceleration vector, the, um, you take the derivative of t squared t cubed, which will be 2t, 3t squared. I put 1 in there, and that gives you the vector 2, 3. So as I said, it's kind of a rough sketch here. But starting at the point 1, 1, I go over 2, up 3, and there's the end of that vector. We'll see how that vector runs. So if this vector was extended further down, you would see it would be a very good, you know, tan it would be a tangent vector at that point. Now for the acceleration vector, we take the next derivative, 2t will be 2, 3t squared will be 6t, 
put in one, you'll get two, six. And then so I start at the same point, go over two, just by coincidence that they're both two, and go up six, and there's the acceleration vector. So I mentioned here that the acceleration vector will almost always lie inside the curvature of the plane curve. Right? There could be exceptions. So I don't want to say 100% of the time. But, you know, inside the curve and not away from the curve. So like I just, drew, I just drew a couple of examples. Like it could be going that way. But the velocity vector is always tangent. And then this one comes, goes this way, inside the curve. You know, this one's inside the curve. So, okay. Like I say, I don't think you're going to have to be graphing these that much. So Now, let's take a look at this example. Now we have this vector value function. T squared i plus tj plus 2t cubed, g to 3 halves, excuse me, k. So we're going to find the velocity, speed, and acceleration. So it's not asking at a particular point in this case. So obviously if it's asking for at a point or a value for t, we'll definitely have numerical answers here. But these are just uh, vector functions of t. So real straightforward, velocity, just take the derivative. t squared is 2t, t is 1. 3 halves times 2 is 3, makes that t to the 1 half. And then the next derivative, 2t will be 2, 1 will be 0. And then 1 half, 3 halves, t to the negative 1 half. And then speed is the magnitude of the velocity. So 2t all squared would be 4t squared. 1 would be 1. And 3t to the 1 half all squared would be 9t. I didn't know. If that bugs you, you can rearrange the order of the 9t and the 1. But that's not certainly anything mathematically important. And just for fun, I let Maple graph this thing and let it do the velocity and acceleration vector. Like I said, maybe it, I never can figure out for sure which is the best way to twist the picture around and make it look its best in 3D, but I think you can clearly see at least that velocity vector. You can sort of see the tangent component of it there. You know, that, that looks okay in that position. And then, of course, the acceleration vector is going inside the curve here. So, But don't worry, you should not be responsible, not in my class, but for ever having to graph any of that. But I thought it was kind of neat to use the technology to look at it. Here's another one. Uh, now, this time I just wrote it in component form. Did I do that? No, I didn't for the last one. But this one now, component form, ln of t, 1 over t, t to the fourth, at t equals 2. So now we're looking for velocity, speed, and acceleration at t equals 2. So the derivative of ln of t would be 1 over t. 1 over t is t to the negative 1, so it ends up being negative 1 over t squared. And t to the fourth is 4t cubed. Plug 2 in there, so the velocity vector will be 1 over 2. Negative 1 over 2 squared is negative 1 fourth. 4 times 2 cubed is 4 times 8, which is 32. We take the next derivative. Now, at this point, if you wanted to find that, you know, I, I wrote velocity, speed, and acceleration. So, obviously, you know, once you have the velocity, you can get the speed at that point. Uh, so, even I wrote, I wrote it that way. I chose to do speed last, but obviously that doesn't. I could switch the order of these two if I wanted to. So once we have velocity, we're ready for the speed. So, 1 over t will be negative 1 over 2 squared. And then negative 1 over t squared will have a derivative of 2 over t cubed. And then 4t cubed will be 12t squared. And then I put 2 in here. I'll get negative 1 over 4. And this will be 2 over 8 in the middle. So that's 1 over 4. And then 12 times 4 will be 48. And then velocity, I'll take the um, magnitude of the, the speed is the magnitude of the velocity, excuse me. Maybe it would have been smart to do this velocity uh, vector second. So, you know what? I 
I think I'll just go ahead and switch it right here and live action here. So, reason why I say that is because this this would reduce the chance of of you accidentally looking at the acceleration vector and taking the magnitude of it instead of the velocity vector. So that probably was the smarter way to do it. So one half squared is one fourth, negative one fourth, one sixteenth. Thirty two squared is ten twenty four. All right, so you know obviously you can use the math frac in your calculator if you want to. That's fine. I just used common denominators here and got everything over sixteen. In fact, why don't I just kind of do that in real time so you can see it? Clear that. So I'll go one over four. And I know it's 1024 and 1 16th. So I was just kind of manually getting the common denominators there and doing it. I still kind of like to do it old school as much as possible. I've always been pretty good at working with numbers in my head, so I kind of like to. Well, that's kind of weird. It wouldn't math bracket for me there. Well, okay. Just out of curiosity, I'm gonna try this. But I know I got the. I can obviously check my answer to make sure it's right. I'm not going to. I know I'm pretty sure it's right. All right, let's go math frac here. All right, now that should give me something five sixteenths. Now I'm gonna go plus. 10, 24. Now, see if it'll math bracket. Well, that's pretty rude. So that's, um, so I guess it doesn't hurt to have some sort of skill here to be able to do this. <laughs> um, yeah, I could try this and show you. That's the decimal equivalent. 16,389. No, I just need 16 over, no, I need the square root, excuse me. 16,389. Oh, I erased that number I already had up there. If you saw it, 10, to whatever it was, 10, 89. Yeah. But I'll recognize the number. It was 1024.3125, I think. Yeah, see, that was it. But that is really bizarre why it would not convert that to a fraction. Now, I'm not, I wish I could tell you why, but I'm not the uh, expert on the calculator programming. But there it is. There's there's the correct answer. And then just for grins, I reduced the did not the square root of 16 and made it 4. But I wouldn't really care that you did that. If it was a handwritten answer in a test, I would certainly consider that to be correct. I do like exact answers, though. So, uh, so I would not want that converted to a decimal. Now, of course, you can do it that way if it's multiple choice and you're just checking your answer. You could make it decimal. Um, so, anyway, I think I made that problem much more involved than it needed to be. A lot of calculator stuff, so. So, let's see what's next here. Find the position vector by integration. Yeah, this was similar to a type of problem I did in a video uh, on integration of uh, vector value functions, where it kind of gives you these conditions and means we can solve for C. All right, to solve this, this one we have to integrate twice to get back to R. So, you, you know, the an acceleration, the antiderivative acceleration will be velocity and then back to our vector value function. So, 
So you notice that zero, that bold zero is the zero vector, not the number zero. So I'm going to go through this one rather quickly because it's not too bad. So the antiderivative of 2i plus 3k would just be 2ti plus 3tk plus some constant vector, which we're going to solve for. So if we know that b of 0 equals 4j, I can put 4j over on this side and put 0 into the right side, which will zero out these two components, solve for c, and we'll get 4j just happens to be c. So that means our velocity function is actually now 2ti plus 4j plus 3tk. So we integrate one more time. The antiderivative of 2t would be t squared. The antiderivative of 4 is 4t. And the antiderivative of 3t would be 3 halves t squared and then plus a new constant vector, which says that r of 0 equals 0. And all these are going to be 0. So we're saying 0 on the left side, and they're all zeros over here. So the C2 would equal the zero vector, so we don't add anything to it. That's going to be it right there. That's gone, it goes away. But, but keep in mind, you know, if you plug in zero, there are certain, you know, functions like uh, exponential function E and cosine that you plug in zero, you don't get zero, you get one. But, but obviously, it's, so don't automatically just start putting zeros in there. But obviously, for these polynomial terms and stuff, yeah, those are going to automatically be zero. So here's our value. And then what am I saying here? You can plug in a value of t to find the position of rt at time t. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I don't know why I did that. I guess just because I guess you could, you know, in other words. So anyway, yeah, that, this part wasn't really necessary because it wasn't asking. Unless I asked it, didn't see it. Oh yeah. Okay, excuse me. It did say that in the instructions. Find the position at t equals 2. So, all right, it did say that. Well, the way I worded it here made it sound arbitrary. That's why I was confused. I should have said t equals 2 here. That's all right. So, it's 4. Put 2 in there. You'll get 4, 8, and then 6. Vector. Position function for a projectile. Well, some of you are going to have experience in this from doing this possibly, you know, in physics or whatever. We're going to look at it from this parametric form where, you know, x and y are both functions of time t. And it's not where, you know, where the height doesn't have to be determined by the uh, position of, uh, horizontal value position, you know, where they can be separate. You can get the height and then have the position, also known as the range here. That's what the range is going to be. The range will be how far out it goes along the x-axis. All right. So let's look at these two functions. I won't read these out since you can kind of look at them, but I, over here I do say that v0 is initial speed, 8 zero is initial height, and then theta is the angle of elevation. And then depending on whether we're using English or metric units, depends on which constant you use right here. Let's take a look at this particular problem. And determine the range and maximum height of a projectile fired at a height of 3,000 feet above the ground with an initial velocity of 900 feet per second at an angle of 35 degrees above the horizontal. So obviously, you know, I'm not a physics expert, but I'm assuming that we're, everything, we're considering this to be under, you know, no vacuum type system, and no wind effect or anything. So obviously that would change everything if we got a wind factor. So if you're 3,000 feet above the ground and you're firing at 900 feet per second, that's probably going to go pretty far, I'm guessing. So H0, initial height, 300. V0 is 900. 
Theta is 35 degrees and the G is 32 because we're dealing with English units. Now, sometimes people, you know, they try to use other formulas, which if it works, that's fine from physics and stuff. But you got to keep in mind that, uh, you know, this is, it, actually, this is pretty easy when you start from the ground. It's a little more challenging than, so whatever formula you're using, you know, better account for the uh, initial height. Since the, because we're looking for the maximum height. And in a, in a normal parabola starting at the ground, the maximum height is going to be the vertex of that, of that parabola, which is halfway from the distance. This is a little bit different because we're, you know, there, there's, there's going to be a sort of a vertex, but we're kind of launching it like this, where it's above the ground, and then it goes up and then lands down on the ground like that. Now the maximum height, because it's going to occur at that top part, going back to this sort of basic calculus, uh, it's where you're going to have that horizontal tangent line, wherever that occurs in that curve. So we have to find the maximum height will occur. So what we're going to do is find the t for you know when it occurs. It's going to occur when y, y prime of t, the derivative for that component, equals zero. And then the actual maximum height, then you would take that value t and plug it back into the y equation. So here's the formula up here for the y equation right here. So I'm going to plug in all the relevant numbers from this problem into that formula right there. So here would be the y of t. Now I need to take the derivative of that respect to t. Now, notice how I've got parentheses wrapped around this. It's very important because sometimes people mess this up. That the they might think of this as sine of 35t. That is not correct. Because if it was sine of 35t, its derivative would be cos 35 cosine of 35t. But that's not right. Uh, this 900 sine of 35 degrees is all a multiplied constant of the t. So that's why you don't have cosine right here. So basically, you're taking the derivative of t, which is 1, so you just have the 900 sine of 35. And then the derivative of 16t squared will be negative 32t. So we set that equal to 0 and solve. And just make sure you're in degree mode in the calculator when you solve this over to the right. And, of course, whatever the appropriate round, rounding tells you in the problem for the number of decimals. But, um, yeah, this one we want rounded answers to some degree there. Well, I just used 3. I don't know why. I just did. But 900 sine of 35 degrees divided by 32 would be 16.132 seconds. That's how long it's going to take to get to the ground. That's actually quite a bit of time. So the maximum height, then you take the 16.132 and just plug it right into that equation. So that's all I'm doing right here. So it's just number crunching, not much for me to explain. Just want to explain to you where it was being applied. So it's going right into here. Let's put that in the calculator, and I got 71.63.78 feet. And then it is asking for the range. So the range will be x of t. And so it's v0 cos theta t. Now what happened there? Now we didn't know how long it takes for this projectile to get to the ground. This one's kind of messy because you have to use quadratic formula, but that's all right. Because it's going to be the, the, we have to find the t, where, in other words, y of t represents the height. So we have to find out the height of t where y of t is going to be zero. 
Now, because we're starting at 3,000 feet, it's a quadratic equation, you're going to get two answers. And one of those is actually going to be a negative answer for time. So we know that's not going to be the right one. Um, but for example, if you were starting from the ground, you would get zero with one of your times. Um, but obviously, you want to use the larger of the two times because you know that's when it's hitting the ground at the end of the process. So I plugged in into this equation. So I must have I turned that into whatever this is. 900 sine of 35. I made, uh, made it into a decimal. 516.22. And then like I said, you, you can do, I, I, I chose the plus, which I'm pretty sure was gonna, it would be the right one every, well, I don't want to say that for sure. Maybe it depends on like if this was a negative or something, maybe the minus one would be. Whatever the point being, if you do the plus and minus, if you do both of them, it wouldn't hurt because it's going to be the larger of the two times. So maybe there's a scenario where the minus would actually be right. I'm not sure off the top of my head, but anyway. So I plug this in the quadratic formula and I got 37.29 seconds. So it's taken 16 point whatever seconds to reach its maximum height. 16.132 seconds to reach its high point. I might have misspoke earlier and said that was its total travel time. I'm not sure if I did. I'm correcting it now. But let me say 16.132 is how long it took to get to its maximum height. And then by 37.29 seconds, it's on the ground again. So you just put 37.29 into this x of t function to give you the range, and you get 27.491.6 feet. So here's just some of the calculations done in the calculator. You can look at them. But here's what I was talking about is how if you, you know you would have gotten a negative t over here if you would have done both parts of that, and then we use the positive t. So. Wow, so that thing is going uh, out about five miles under that those conditions. That's pretty powerful. Now here's one that says projectiles fire from the ground at an angle of 22 degrees to the horizontal. It has a range of 200 meters. Find the minimum initial velocity necessary. Basically, the velocity it takes to get it to go 200 meters at that angle. All right. Just kind of work what we have here. Now, because we are using metric, this number will be 4.9 because it'll be half of the gravity, which half of 9.8 is 4.9. So it's either going to be 4.9 if it's metric or 16 if it's in English units. So what I did here is I kind of set up, a, we have to set up an equation with two variables, two unknowns here. So we're, we're looking for the V0. So 200 would equal V0 cos of 22 times whatever T is. And over here, uh, we don't, it's from the ground level, so H0 in the equation is just 0. Right there, that's just 0. And so we have nothing here. So it's V0 sine of 22 degrees T minus 4.9 T squared. So when it gets to the ground again, we know this height is going to be 0. So we can set this equation equal to 0. And then I factored out a T because we don't want the T equal 0. Obviously, like I said, it's going to be on the ground twice at the beginning. And then at the end, we want, we want the one at the end, obviously. So I'll take 0 equals V0 sine of 22 minus 4.9T. And then if I solve this equation right here for T, I get V0 sine of 22 divided by 4.9. I can plug it in for that T, and then my only variable will be V0, and we can solve for that initial velocity. So that's what I'm going to do.
So I have 200 equals V0 cos of 22 times V0 sine of 22 divided by 4.9. So that gives me uh, V0 squared cos of 22 sine of 22. Move the 4.9 over to make 980. So now I know V0 squared equals 980 divided by sine of cos of, sine of 22 cos of 22. And then, of course, to get the, I need the square root of that. Then that'll be the answer, to V0 squared. So I take the square root of this expression, like I did right here in the calculator. Um, I don't know why I didn't use square root. I just raised it to the 0.5 power, which is obviously mathematically correct. I must have, I must have started typing this in the calculator and forgot to put the square root first. I said I didn't feel like going back and changing it when I knew that I could just raise it to the 0.5 power. So 53.118 meters per second so whatever the rounding is so that that's the velocity it takes initial velocity to get it to go 200 meters if it's at an angle of 22 degrees a baseball player at second base throws a ball 90 feet to a player at first base you don't have to be an expert at baseball or anything, you know, it's, it's a pretty straightforward idea. It doesn't even matter that it's baseball, you can just say you're throwing at 90 feet. Uh, the ball's released at 5 feet above the ground with an initial velocity of 50 miles per hour at an angle of 15 degrees above the horizontal. At what height does the player at first base catch the ball? So I guess they're obviously assuming it's going to show up at a, at a correct height. So, you know, depending on the, the numbers in the problem, if it ended up being, you know, well, the ball is going to be uh, 15 feet high when it gets to first base. Well, that means the ball was, was chunked way over their head. Now, this one's a little tricky. I don't think that I would do this to you from a mathematical standpoint, but it doesn't hurt to take a look at this because you never know what some phys physics instructor might try to do. So this is, I think it's good to look at this, you know, just sort of help your overall education here. But, but my point being is, notice that this distance is 90 feet, and this is feet within the velocities in miles per hour. So we have to convert miles per hour into feet per second. And that way we're all working with the same units here. So like I said, I would not do this to you on a test, but this is an excellent exercise to, to, to look at. So I just sort of set up, this is the way I kind of do this, but this is the way I learned this 100 years ago. We'd, we'd set them up like this, and you set them up to where, so 50 miles an hour like that, so we want 50, 280 feet is one mile, and then one hour is 3,600 seconds. So you, you know how to line it up is to make thing, units cancel. So that's how I know which number goes where. So that way, mile and miles cancel, and I want one hour on top and 3,600 seconds on bottom, because that way hour will cancel hour, and I'm left with units of feet per second. And that ends up being 73.33 feet per second. So my range equation, 90, the horizontal distance, will equal 733 cos of 15 times t. So this, this whole entire equation gives us everything we need for the time that it's taking for the ball to get from first to second base. So just do a little basic algebra there and solve this. You get 1.27 seconds. So it's taking 1.27 seconds for the ball to get from second base to first base. And to get the height, you create the height equation from the you know, beginning of this section. Put everything in that's your h0, your initial height was 5. We, we just found this. We converted to the velocity, 73.33, sine of 15 degrees. Um, now we just found the time of 1.27. Now we're back to English units, so it's 16 and not 4.9 times 1.27 squared, and it comes out to be 3.3 feet. So that's a reasonable height for that ball to arrive at first base where it could be caught. Very good.
Let's look at this example. A gun has a muzzle speed of 150 meters per second fired from ground level. Find two angles of elevation that can be used to hit a target 800 meters away. Well, this could be interesting. So evidently there's two angles that will get it to go exactly 800 meters at a speed of 150 meters per second. So I like to just kind of plug everything in there and see what I have. Here's the range equation, 800 meters equals 150 cos theta times t. And then now we're at 4.9 because we're at metric in this equation. Zero, meaning when it hits the ground, it'll equal 150 sine of theta times t. See, the sine of theta is separate from the t, not sine of theta t. Minus 4.9 t squared. So I'm going to factor out the t equals zero, similar to the problem we did a couple of problems ago. And I'm going to solve. But this one, the difference here, though, is we don't have initial velocity. We have angle. So we have t equals 150 sine of theta divided by 4.9. So I'm replacing that into the t for this other equation. So I have this left side. Now I have a new right side. So I cross multiply. I get 150 squared times sine theta cos theta, 800 times 4.9. So I'll divide both sides by 150 squared. So now I have sine theta cos theta equals all this business, which is 0.1742. Now this is a little tricky because you're going sine theta cos theta. How am I going to establish only one theta from that? Okay, well here's what we're going to do. We're going to use a very important trig identity. That sine of 2 theta will equal 2 sine theta cos theta. Therefore, 1 half sine of 2 theta will equal sine theta cos theta. So I can replace sine theta cos theta with 1 half sine of 2 theta. So I'll multiply that by 2 to move that over to the other side. Now, when you're trying to solve for a situation that involves two angles and you use the calculator, the calculator is only going to give you one angle. So you have to come up with the other one. So I'm going to use the inverse trig function. Two, so 2 theta would equal sine inverse of 0 0.3484. And that's going to give me one of the answers. So that means theta is going to be 10.2. Now, because it's 2 theta instead of theta, yeah, this was just theta equals 20.4, for example. The other angle would be 180 minus 20.4. Because if you imagine how, you know, how sine has, uh, think of the unit circle, sine has 2. Like, for example, sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, and sine of 5 pi over 6 is 1 half. And then, but, but they're together, they add up to be 180 degrees. But you have to divide by 2 because of this 2 theta here. So it's 180 minus 20.4, then divided by 2. Or you could just reduce the fact, divide 180 by 2 and make it 90, and go 90 minus 10.2 would be right. And so you get 79.8. And you know what? Just for the heck of it, since you might have, think, you know, might have thought, I don't know if you got that right or not. <laughs> Obviously, you could plug it in back numerically to see if those angles work, but, you know, I wouldn't expect you necessarily to do this, but I graphed it in parametric form. I graphed both of them with each of the angles, and take a look at that. So I didn't, I didn't get the entire path of the red one in the picture, but so the, the 79.8 one's going way up there, coming down, landing right here, and then the shallower angle of 10.2 is coming down, and they're, they're finishing in this same spot right here. So there were two correct angles, and it's probably a good chance that I got those angles correct. So that's that's good. All right, well, that concludes this video on velocity and acceleration of vector-valued functions.